Let us pray. O Lord our God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our passage is the last half of the second chapter of Ephesians. We're only covering the first three chapters, but I know from your great memory that you remember that just this last fall, we actually did the last three chapters of Ephesians first in the series of My Heart, Christ's Home, where all of these grand theological ideas that are densely expressed in the first three chapters find their landing in places where we live in our hearts and in our world. But this is tough going. All the big words are there, and they're all in the same sentence, it seems. One sentence begins this all. I've described it as a big bang, but there's this dense compiling of all of the truths of the Christian faith and one run-on sentence of over a hundred words and no commas. If you were in the eighth grade grammar course, she would have flunked you if you turned in this sentence. Nice try, but no credit. But Paul wants to keep it all together, knows that it's, they're all related, it's all together, and then it explodes in passages like this with a trajectory that goes this way and another trajectory that goes that way. And after the Big Bang, all of the parts are created and all the things are going forward. And now's a passage that goes in a different trajectory, but still starting with that, that compiling of the great truths of the Christian faith. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called the uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcised, a, a thing done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, which he put to death their hostility. And he came and he preached to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Well, along these trajectories, in somewhat mixed fashion, we found out that new blessings have come to us. God has blessed Christ in the heavens, but now all that has come to earth. First, there, is, there are these blessings of a new status. We discover we are elected, holy and blameless, redeemed and forgiven, adopted. There's the blessings of the new life, knowledge and wisdom, hope, power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, and life itself comes. All this God did, to be sure, God gave in love. 
First to Christ, the Father has always loved the Son. And then, because we are in Christ, to us also came all these gifts. All the great words of our faith are in that presentation, grace and mercy and the word faith itself. All of it held together by the simple, often repeated idea, in Christ. We are in Christ. So, again, what are these blessings given to Christ that are now given to us? The blessings of a new status, the blessings of a new life, and in this passage, the blessings of a new community. First, please know that what was once two has now become one. Paul thinks here directly about Jews and Gentiles and names it by name, and he always writes to you, and this you is you Gentiles. That's who gets the letter to the Ephesians. This is Paul's mission, to go to the Gentiles, to go outside of the house of Israel, to bring others into the house of Israel, that the people of God may include all the people, well, all the people that God made. So his mission goes out. It goes out very wide. It's misunderstood. Some hesitate at it. Some, some disagree with it. Some are wildly in support of it. Paul is on it. This passage of this letter reminds us of that. You, who were the uncircumcised, really, that's a way to refer to people? As the not us? Everybody has that, every tribe. I'm not picking on them, but one of the first tribal languages that I learned a little bit was Dakota. Um, among what we, when I was growing up, we learned were the Sioux Indians. What does the word Dakota mean? It means people to the Dakotas, which I am not. I'm not Dakota. I'm a Scot. I'm pretty proud of that, folks. So I get the tribalism. You were separated from Christ. That was, that was the serious business. You were just outside of what God was doing, excluded from citizenship among his people, foreigners to the covenant. God was making great promises, but they weren't about you. You, you were without hope. You were without God in the world. That's about as sad a phrase as I can imagine. But now, you who were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. God's plan has always been not two. It has always been first one, then all. Blessed to be a blessing. Abraham's descendants are to be blessed. God has promised it. It is unilateral. He will do this thing. And then they, with these blessings, will become that, that earthly source, that channel, that faucet that spreads the blessing of God in the world. They were called by God, in some sense, apart from the world to be a people, and then called by God by being sent in the world to be the people for all the people. Jesus, same thing, receives all the blessing of God, just Jesus, not everybody, just Jesus. The blessings go out to all of humanity. In this sense, Jesus is a new Abraham. Yes, it's one. It's not everybody. It's Abraham, one nation out of all the nations, but for the sake of all the nations. They do and they do not fulfill that calling as it plays out in the generations that follow, but Christ fulfills his calling. The blessings given to him will be given to humanity. Now is that time, says Paul, where all of this goes out to all of us. Second, if you've got two things, that's the unhappiest number in the Bible, if you've got two things, you've got a war. Hopefully I just didn't describe your marriage. 
Actually, sometimes if you have one thing, you have a war. <clears throat> I got things inside of me that I war against, and I know some of you think I should war against them and actually win every once in a while. But if you got two things, it might not work out at the end of the day. Yeah? Well, there's two things, Jews and Gentiles. There's my tribe and your tribe. There's usins and themins. Huh? And sometimes there's just me and all the rest of you at our worst. Yeah. Peace needs to be made. He destroys the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility that has divided us, and he does this in his flesh, in his flesh. And we know how this works between God and humanity. Christian theology has been very precise and I think exactly right about this. In Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead deity. He is 100% of what it means to be God. And he is 100% of what it means to be human. Now, in order for there to be a war, there takes, it takes two things, eh? But what if what was once two things are now within one thing? Well, that war is over. God, unhappy with us, to be sure. We, read the Old Testament, unhappy with God, to be sure. Remember the Old Testament is a history of a people who did not choose their God. In Christ, God and humanity is united. That war is over. God speaks in love toward us. So, too, about all of these tribal hostilities. Christ now comes, this time not so much as a new Abraham, but as a new Adam, a second Adam, Paul will say in another letter. Just as all of humanity was an Adam and then we all came from him, first one and then all, so, too, now a second Adam has come, Christ, first one, now all. It's spreading out to everyone. 100% human. All of humanity is reconciled in him. I know where I saw this in play. It was a, I'm going to say it, a proud moment for me as an American and as a Christian. It's Jimmy Carter in the Rose Garden with Anwar Sadat of Egypt and Menachem Begin of Israel and the signing of the Camp David Peace Accords. Yeah, 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 it didn't last forever, what you think was going to happen, but there was a moment there and a right decision with the right people, making the right sacrifices to do the right thing. I was proud. This was an American bringing together Egyptian and Israeli. I was particularly proud, I'll say, a Christian bringing together Jew and Muslim. At the end of the year, the Nobel Prize was given to Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begum, not Jimmy Carter. Rightly so, I think. I think he had done all things well, but he did not make peace. The only people who can make peace are the people who are at war. Only those who pick up arms can lay them down. The rest of us can call for it. The rest of us can plead for it. The rest of us can put strategic things together that honor a people who will do this and therefore encourage them to do it. But we were not at war in Egypt or in Israel. They were at war. Christ is Egypt and Israel and the states, and Afghanistan, and Iraq, and Iran, and China, and England, and every place that's beautiful to you. All of this inside him. And he makes the peace. In his flesh. We've learned to love that phrase as Christians. For he came in the flesh that he might be as us. But we've also learned to appreciate what happened to his flesh. It's about the person and the work of Christ. The cross, Paul says, puts to death 
this hostility. He pays the price for all humanity, Jew and Gentile alike, in every one of our tribes. Each now has a perfect sacrifice offered to make peace. So hostility is to die there and then. There's a phrase in the Old Testament, beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. It's repeated a couple of times in the New Testament. And in with regard to Paul's ministry here to the Gentiles as well. The idea is this. I think we're to imagine, I don't know, some lonely goat herder or whatever in some distant mountain far away from the actual happenings of the world where war is normative. And he kind of fights his own war up there thinking war is all around. But peace has been made. But he's got no word of it. A messenger needs to come and announce this peace. So at risk to himself or herself, the messenger goes up the mountain and announces the good news of peace. And yes, it really is about feet that are now probably bloody. You're going to cleanse them, care for them, maybe even caress those feet. How beautiful (coughs) on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Paul says, Jesus preaches this peace. It's nailed, scarred feet. And the mountain is Calvary. In Christ, now both have access to the Father by the one spirit. Vertical division has become overcome horizontal divisions. That is, you and I, now being united in Christ, that vertical division being removed, all the horizontal ones between each other are now being removed and erased in place. Paul becomes the first great preacher of this gospel, that is to go out to all and announces that we are all now one in Christ. He preaches it in words and he preaches it in deeds. Paul will be arrested for illegally aiding and abetting the entry of a Gentile, a man from Ephesus to be particular, from this place, from aiding and abetting him entrance into the temple. Actually, we don't know if Paul actually did that. He was accused of it. But those who were against Paul that wanted the wars to continue, accuse him of this. They knew where his gospel was leading. If Paul is preaching the truth and if people believe it, this temple will no longer be our temple. It'll become everybody's temple. And what would be the point of that? Well, that's the point of the temple altogether. There is only one God, and he has made only one people, which is our third and last point. We are members of one household, no longer foreigners and aliens, no longer, uh, we are now fellow citizens. We are members of God's household, our household of faith. I know that that's your favorite metaphor and favorite self-reference as a congregation, I heard that when I first came. I hear it still. It is strong. I endorse it. It is wonderful. Let's be careful. Can I say, this is not our household of faith. It is God's household of faith. God has done the inviting. God has done all the hard work. God has done all the including. What remains for us is to embrace. Dale Bruner is one of my favorite Bible teachers. He's here in Southern California and will be here in August at a national gathering that we're hosting. Come and hear Dale again if you haven't heard him at all or want to hear him again like I do. He has a wonderful illustration. He has so many of them. I think most of the illustrations of most of the preachers in Presbyterian pulpits in Southern California are just borrowing from Dale. I think that's what's happening. And it's just a race to get there first so we can pass it off as our own. This is an old one. I probably said it so many times that I probably now got it somewhat wrong and Dale would disavow this illustration. But when asked the question... Who's in and who's out? Who determines who's in and who's out? Bad way to ask the question, but 
how would you answer it in a right way? Think of the cross, he says. Two beams, a vertical and a horizontal. The vertical is for you and me. Our job is to exalt the Savior. Frankly, who's in second place, eh? So we are to exalt Jesus. This is the Savior of the world. This is the provision that God has made for his people everywhere and in every time. Jesus and Jesus alone is the salvation of God. And we are to exalt him and no other. But that horizontal beam, well, that would be Jesus reaching out and gathering in all whom he chooses to bring to himself. Not my job. I'm not the Savior. Not the church's job. We're not the Savior. We're the gathered in. We're those who have felt the embrace and under no circumstance would deny that same embrace to the other. Yes, we come in those packages, us and the other. But Jesus builds us into one household. This household, this building, is rising to become a holy temple. We are being built into a dwelling place for God. Yes, yes, Christ has gone to heaven to build mansions for you and me. I'm counting on it. But Christ is also building you and me into a temple here and now that God may dwell within and among us. This is the language of the new humanity. A bold phrase. A new humanity. New people have been created out of all of the people. One, people. Remember, it's never two in God's plan. It's one in order to be all. And he calls this one in order to be the representative of the new humanity for the sake of all humanity. Representative of what all humanity will be in Christ, who is in God, and who is now dwelling in us, we being his holy temple. Well, that's a lot to think about. It's a lot to meditate on. We who are in Christ are, like a new Abraham, blessed to be a blessing, a new people for the sake of all the people, and like a new Adam, newly alive all of humanity. So, let me be straightforward about this. Divisions deny this gospel. Our petty, personal quarrels make small what is large. Our sustained splits put the world's peace at risk. Our ecclesial divisions are assumed too easily, and they confuse a world that awaits reunion with its creator, though they don't know it, and they deafen a world to the sounds which cause them to hear of God's Redeemer. Our disharmonies within the church put the whole world off key. Choir, the people of God are the section leaders in the choir of God. We are required to live and sing our notes true and clear that others have a fighting chance to sing well as well. Our distancing away from the world which is dying without Christ withdraws its life. Our separations, which obscure the blessing of God given to us, 
that we are one people withholds the blessings of a new humanity given for all the people. Let me put it in the positive. A people called, built, indwelt, and sent by God who are one and at peace proclaims this gospel. You who were far away have been brought near. Praise be to Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, gather us now at your table. One people. Some of us well established in the faith, some of us struggling for faith. Believers and doubters alike. But being called to be your household in which you dwell and send us from the table for the sake of the world. Amen.